Hi everyone, this is the Dartmouth Knights here and we are really excited to be reading chapter three with everyone. Um, this is Mrs. Anderson and I am very excited. I've got Mrs. Farmer with us. Say hi, Mrs. Hi. And Mr. Manami. Hello everyone, how are you? So we are practicing social distancing as we are going to be reading to each of you from our homes. So um, I'm excited as I'm going to kick us off with the very beginning of chapter three in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you have a copy, you can read along with us or just go ahead and listen along as we continue our story. Lucy ran out of the empty room and into the passage and found the other three. It's all right, she repeated. I'm come back. What on earth are you talking about, Lucy? asked Susan. Why, Lucy said in amazement, haven't you been wondering where I was? So you've been hiding, have you? said Peter. Poor old Lou, hiding and nobody noticed? You'll have to hide longer than that if you want people to start looking for you. But I've been away for hours and hours, said Lucy. The others all stared at one another. Batty, said Edmund, tapping his head. Quite batty. What do you mean, Lou? asked Peter. <laughs> what I said, answered Lucy. It was just after breakfast when I went into the wardrobe. And I've been away for hours and hours. And I had tea and all sorts of things happened. Don't be silly, Lucy, said Susan. We've only just come out of that room a moment ago, and you were there then. She's not being silly at all, said Peter. She's just making up a story for fun, aren't you, Lou? And why shouldn't she? No, Peter, I'm not, she said. It's, it's a magic wardrobe. There's wood inside it, and it's snowing, and there's a fawn and a witch, and it's called Narnia. Come and see. The others did not know what to think, but Lucy was so excited that they all went back with her to her room. She rushed ahead of them, flung open the door, and cried, Now, go in and see for yourselves. <clears throat> Why, you goose, said Susan, putting her head inside and pulling the fur coats apart. It's just an ordinary wardrobe. Look, there's the back of it. Then everyone looked in and pulled the coats apart. And they all saw, Lucy herself saw, a perfectly ordinary wardrobe. There was no wood, no snow, and only the back of the wardrobe with hooks on it. Peter went in and wrapped his knuckles on it to make sure that it was solid. A jolly good hoax, Lou, he said as he came out again. You really had us taken in. I must admit, we half believed you. But it wasn't a hoax at all, said Lucy, really and truly. It's all different a moment ago. Honestly, it was, I promise. Come, Lou, said Peter. That's going a bit far. You've had your joke. Hadn't you better drop it now? Lucy grew very red in the face and tried to say something, though she hardly knew what she was trying to say, and she burst into tears. For the next few days, she was miserable. She could have made it up with the others quite easily at any moment, but if she could have only brought herself to say the whole thing was only a story made up for fun. But Lucy was a very truthful girl and she knew that she really was in the right and she could not bring herself to say this. The others who thought she was telling a lie and a silly lie too, made her very unhappy. The two elder ones did this without meaning to do it, but Edmund could be spiteful. And on this occasion, he was spiteful. He sneered and jeered at Lucy and kept on asking her if she found any other new countries and other cupboards all over the world. What made it worse was that these days ought to have been delightful. The weather was fine and they were out of the doors from morning until night, bathing, fishing, climbing trees, and lying in the heather. But Lucy could not properly enjoy any of it. And so things went on until the next wet day. That day, when it came to the afternoon and there was still no sign of a break in weather, they decided to play hide and seek. Susan, it, was it, as soon as the others scattered to hide. Lucy went into the room where the wardrobe was. She did not mean to hide in the wardrobe because she knew that that would only set the others to talking again about the whole wretched business. But she did want to have one more look inside of it 
For this time, she was beginning to wonder herself whether Narnia and the fawn had been not a dream. The house was so large and complicated and full of hiding places that she thought she would have time to look into the wardrobe and then hide somewhere else. But as soon as she reached it, she heard steps in the passage outside. And then there was nothing but for her to jump into the wardrobe and hold the door behind her. She did not shut it properly because she knew that it was very silly to shut oneself into a wardrobe, even if not a magic one. Mr. Manami, why don't you take it from here? Thank you very much. Continuing on, now the steps she had heard were those of Edmund, and he came into the room just in time to see Lucy vanishing into the wardrobe. He at once decided to get into it himself not because he thought it particularly a good place to hide, but because he wanted to go on teasing her about her imaginary country. He opened the door. There were co the coats hanging up as usual, and the smell of mothballs, and darkness, and silence, and no sign of Lucy. She thinks I'm Susan coming to catch her, said Edmund to himself, and so she kept very quiet in at the back. He jumped in and shut the door forgetting what a very foolish thing it is to do. Then he began feeling about for Lucy in the darkness. He had expected to find her within a few seconds and was very surprised when he did not. He decided to open the door again and let in some light, but he could not find the door either. He didn't like this at all and began groping wildly in every direction. He even shouted, Lucy, Lou, where are you? I know you're here. <clears throat> there was no answer, and Edmund noticed that his own voice had a curious sound, not the sound you expect in a cupboard, but the kind of open-air sound. He also noticed that he was unexpectedly cold, and then he saw a light. Thank goodness, said Edmund. The door must have swung open of its own accord. He forgot all about Lucy and went towards the light, which he thought was an open door of the wardrobe. But instead of finding himself stepping out into a spare room, he found himself stepping out in the shadow of some thick, dark fir trees into an open place in the middle of a wood. There was a crisp, dry snow under his feet and more snow lying on the branches of the trees. Overhead, there was a pale blue sky, the sort of sky one sees on a fine winter day in the morning. Straight ahead of him, he saw between tree trunks the sun, just rising very red and clear. Everything was perfectly still, as if there were only living creatures in that country. There was not even a robin or a squirrel among the trees, and the woods stretched as far as he could see in every direction. He shivered. Mrs. Farmer, you're up. Right. He now remembered that he had been looking for Lucy and also how unpleasant he had been to her about her imaginary country, which now turned out not to have been imaginary at all. He thought that she must be somewhere quite close. So he shouted, Lucy, Lucy, I'm here too. Edmund. There was no answer. She's angry about all the things I've been saying lately, thought Edmund and thought he did not like to admit that he had been in the wrong. He also did not like much, did not much like being alone in this strange, cold, quiet place. So he shouted again. I say, Lou, I'm sorry. I didn't believe you. I see now that you were right all along. Do come out, make it Pax. Still, there was no answer. Just like a girl, said Edmund to himself, sulking somewhere and won't accept an apology. He looked round him again and decided he did not much like this place, and he almost made up his mind to go home when he heard, very far off in the woods, a sound of bells. He listened, and the sound came nearer and nearer, and at last there swept into sight a sled drawn by two reindeer. The reindeer were about the size of Shetland ponies, and their hair was so white that even the snow could hardly look white compared to them. Their branching horns were gilded and shone like something on fire from the sunrise at when the sunrise caught them. Their harnesses were of scarlet leather and covered with bells. 
On the sled driving the reindeer sat a fat dwarf who would have been about three feet high if he had been standing. He was dressed in a polar bear's fur on his head. He wore a red hood and a long gold tassel hanging down from its point. His huge beard covered his knees and served him instead of a rug. But behind him, on a much higher seat in the middle of the sled, sat a very different person, a great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. She was also covered in white fur up to her throat and held a long, straight golden wand in her right hand and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. The sled was a fine sight as it came sweeping toward Edmund with the bells jingling and the dwarf cracking his whip and the snow flipping up on each side of it. Stop, said the lady, and the dwarf pulled the reindeer up so sharply that they almost sat down. Then they recovered themselves and stood, chomping their bits and blowing. In the frosty air, the breath coming out of their nostrils looked like smoke. And what, pray, are you, said the lady, looking hard at Edmund. I'm, I'm, my name's Edmund, said Edmund rather awkwardly. He did not like the way she looked at him. The lady frowned. Is that how you address a queen, she asked, looking sterner than ever. I beg your pardon, your majesty. I didn't know, said Edmund. Not know the queen of Narnia, cried she. Ha, you shall know us better hereafter. But I repeat, what are you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I don't know what you mean. I'm at school. At least I was. It's the holiday now. And that's the end of chapter three. We hope that you will join us tomorrow as we continue to see where the adventures take Edmund and Lucy in Narnia.